I feel honored by that introduction. I was already honored uh, to be asked to talk at this conference, the 20th anniversary of the Campbell Collaboration. Uh, I remember when this organization was getting started, uh, and including things like the energetic help we got from Suryan Chalmers and the foundational work that Bob Baruch did uh, to get the organization going. I remember the first meeting of the collaboration and those early meetings in Philadelphia. Uh, we had hopes for what might be possible for it, um, but we also had worries. Uh, we worried if anybody would come to the meetings, then we worried if they came once, if they'd ever come back. And most importantly, we, we know that professional organizations depend on the hard work of members. And we wondered if people would continue to commit their time and energy to the mission of the organization. But now after 20 years, it seems obvious that the answer to those questions is yes. Um, the organization's achieved a lot more than any of us dared hope at that time. But I think the reason for that is that it arose out of a, out of a vision of what we believed was an urgent scientific and policy need. Campbell's been a key part of an intellectual shift that's created a new professional specialty of systematic reviewers and new institutions of which Campbell is one uh, that support the specialty of systematic reviewing. Before I go into great detail uh, about the, um, this new professional identity and these new institutions, uh, I'd like to start with a little history. And most of that history is history that um, some of you know, many of you know it all, but there's probably a few aspects of that history that uh, will be unfamiliar to you. And it, it has relevance in understanding where our field is today. Uh, here's some history that you probably know, most of you anyhow. Uh, this term systematic review seems to have first been used by Archie Cochran in a review of medical research about 1979. And it's certainly possible that other people use that term earlier, but that's one date that many of us look back to. About 1980, there was an important paper by Greg Jackson that was an empirical evaluation of the quality of research reviews in the social sciences. And uh, Greg's review found that reviews in social science weren't very methodologically adequate. Uh, getting out of order a little bit, uh, but, for a, but for I think a good reason, uh, a similar kind of empirical review in the medical sciences was done by Cindy uh, Mulrow in 1987 and published in the Annals of Internal Medicine. Did the same kind of thing, evaluated reviews in medicine and found them to be of fairly low quality on, uh, as a, as a you know, normative statement. In 1982, Harris Cooper published an important paper, a really seminal paper on scientific standards for systematic reviews, arguing that reviews ought to meet the same kinds of methodological standards that primary research did, and outlining a kind of model for uh, the validity concerns about systematic reviews. In 1986, or thereabouts, the early 1980s, uh, Ian Chalmers and his colleagues created the Oxford Database of Perinatal Medicine. I chose the date 1986 is because that's when they, they wrote a paper about it in the British Medical Journal. The Oxford Database of Perinatal Trials was the predecessor of the Cochrane Collaboration and um, also proved to be the database that led to the creation of a very important and uh, really pathbreaking book, Effective Care in Pregnancy and Childbirth in two volumes uh, by Ian uh, Murray Inkin and, and colleagues. And what was important about effective care in pregnancy and childbirth is that you can point to it as being really a landmark in evidence-based medicine. It was a medical textbook that attempted to make all its recommendations about care on the basis of systematic reviews of scientific literature. It got a lot of attention, as you might expect. There's kind of a parallel history of meta-analysis. Uh, the term, I'm sure you're, uh, many of you know, uh, was invented by uh, an education psychologist, Gene Glass, as the analysis of statistical analyses. Uh, these are the methods we often use in, in uh, the synthesis part of systematic reviews. And that was in 1976. 
1981, uh, Gene Glass and his colleagues published uh, the first book on meta-analysis called Meta-Analysis for Social Research. Um, a couple of, a few years later, three years later, there, there, there were already three books on uh, systematic reviewing and meta-analysis, uh, but really the emphasis was on meta-analysis in all of these books. Harris Cooper, Dick Light, and uh, David Pillamer, and then Bob Rosenthal all had published small books on meta-analysis by 1984. In 1985, Inger Molkin and I published the first really thorough uh, technical statistical treatment of meta-analysis. And there's a date in 1986 that may not uh, be familiar to too many of you, but it was an important date as far as meta-analysis was concerned because it was the date of a meeting that the US National Academy of Sciences through the Committee on National Statistics uh, created a meeting on the future of methodology for meta-analysis. The reason this meeting was important is because at the time there were statisticians who, and scientists who believed that meta-analysis didn't deserve to have a future. And that meeting um, held oddly enough in Hedgesville, West Virginia in a, in a resort, um, was important in creating a firm foundation, a political foundation within the scientific world for uh, meta-analysis as a scientific technique. And I offer 1994 as an as a important time because that was uh, marked the publication of, the, of what we now know was the first handbook of research synthesis which brought together authors uh, who were working on systematic reviews and working on the statistical parts of uh, systematic reviewing that is meta-analysis and contributed some kind, uh, contributed one reference for a great deal of the things that were relevant to what we now see as our field. But there's some history you might not know that is relevant to what I have to say later today. And that history uh, begins with uh, a 1905 paper by Carl Pearson. Uh, this is the same Carl Pearson who invented the correlation coefficient, or at least for whom the correlation coefficient is named. He published a, we published two reviews in the British Medical Journal of the effectiveness of typhoid vaccine. What's interesting about these particular papers is although they were published an awful long time before the term meta-analysis was invented, they look fairly modern as meta-analyses. If you read them, you might quibble about the way in which they combine the effect sizes across, across studies, but nonetheless, it looks pretty much like uh, a modern meta-analysis. Uh, each study uh, was used to create an effect size estimate, which was not surprisingly a correlation coefficient, Devin Pearson was doing it. And uh, then he combined those across studies to try to conclude something about the effectiveness of the vaccine. I suspect not too many of you know the 1932 reference, uh, or even maybe have heard the name Raymond Burge. Burge was a physicist at UC Berkeley, the University of California at Berkeley. And in 1932, he published the first methods paper on combining the results of experiments in physics. If you read that paper, you'd recognize it as being very modern. He recommended weighting of effects from different studies. He understood how to calculate their standard error, the combined standard error and the statistical significance of the combined effects. He understood how to uh, test whether or not the effects were consistent with one another using something that was essentially just the Q test. And Burge's name is remembered in physics um, for <clears throat> an index of uh, consistency of results across studies, which is just the Q test statistic divided by its degrees of freedom. It's called the Burge ratio in physics. 25 years later, uh, 1957, the particle data group was founded appropriately enough at UC Berkeley. Um, it, was found, it was a group of physicists who came together to do systematic reviews of experiments on high energy physics, elementary particle physics. And they have been doing that every two years, publishing something called the Review of Particle Properties ever since. It's a key resource for high energy physics 
researchers. In 1964, the US National Bureau of Standards created the National Standard Data Reference System, importantly involving not just scientists that worked at NBS, which was a government organization, but several external critical review centers. And these external critical review centers were charged with doing systematic reviews of research in physical chemistry and physics and areas related to uh, technology and science. And I'll mention a couple of years after that, the, the work of review centers was recognized as being of international importance by the founding of the Committee on Data for Science and Technology, uh, known as CODATA. It was founded by the International Council of Scientific Unions. Both of these efforts, these last two efforts, were all about systematic reviewing for creating reliable data for science and technology. And to give you a sense of what these reviews look like, here's an example from one of the recent CODATA reviews. You may recognize this kind of picture as being a forest plot. What you see is that the rows correspond to different studies conducted on different times. Uh, each of the rows has a little dot with a set of whiskers extending either side from it. Uh, those are the point estimates of the quantity of interest and the whiskers represent confidence intervals for the estimate of that quantity. So what you see here is a forest plot of the results of studies that all tried to estimate the universal gravitation constant. And like any good forest plot, there's, a, um, there's the combined value, the co-data recommended value in 2014 that I've circled in red here. And uh, I guess one feature of this, this picture is, uh, first of all, it's quite familiar because it's a forest plot of the kind we see frequently in systematic reviews. Uh, also, it's uh, recognizable because you notice that all the studies don't get exactly the same answer. In physics, there is variation across studies in the answers that they get. And um, that should reassure us in the social sciences that even in the best of sciences, um, there is some variation across studies in results and that's to be expected, even good sciences, which you know, I'm willing to at least acknowledge that physics represents the, you know, the pinnacle of, many, of science in many ways. So where are we today and what does this have to do with the Campbell collaboration and, and uh, systematic reviews in, in social research. Well, I'd like to argue that over the last 20 years, a, a new professional specialty has emerged, that of the systematic reviewer. Now, what do I mean by a new professional specialty? What are the, what are the, what are the hallmarks of, of a professional specialty? Well, a professional specialty uh, arises when there's a group of, of people who recognize they use specialized methods and share common problems. Uh, when the group creates professional meetings and perhaps professional associations uh, to share their work and support their activities. Uh, it's a professional specialty when they begin to create special recognitions and, and accomplishments for professional activity in the area. Uh, when specialty journals are created, when professional and academic training programs begin to be created in the area, and when professional positions start requiring competence in that area. Well, we know that um, a group of specialists in systematic reviewing have created the Campbell Collaboration as a venue to share their work and support their activity. We know that, that the collaboration has created professional meetings to do just that. We've created professional recognitions for accomplishment like the Mosteller and Baruch Awards. We've started a journal. Uh, Campbell has been doing academic and professional training since the very beginning. There are academic training programs in many universities, many, uh, many courses on systematic reviews. Uh, there are 
professional positions that are beginning to require the ability and, and competence and experience in systematic reviewing. And so far, there are, um, uh, there are a few uh, professorships in evidence synthesis, but uh, so far, no formal academic training leading to degrees that have the name systematic reviewing uh, attached to them, but maybe that's to come. Now, I use the word meta-analysis to focus on the statistical component of systematic review. Some people use the term very broadly to encompass everything in systematic reviews, but that seems, uh, that seems to me to be uh, not quite right. And partly I say that because meta-analysis has kind of grown into a thriving specialty in statistics uh, that is somewhat distinct from systematic reviewing. But like systematic reviewing, meta-analysis has become a professional specialty. They've created a professional association which has its own meetings, the Society for Research Synthesis Methods uh, got going in 2005. Um, the Society for Research Synthesis Methods has created professional recognition that is prizes the, uh, for work in that area. The Olkin Award and the Shaddish Award are examples of that. Uh, they've started their own journal, uh, the journal called Research Synthesis Methods. Uh, they have created professional training programs and uh, other professional training programs have been created by scientific and government organizations. Uh, there are many graduate courses in meta-analysis in universities around the world. But again, I don't know of any, any formal degree program in, uh, in meta-analysis, but nonetheless, it's very much in the curriculum of many universities. Uh, I see meta-analysis and systematic reviewing as complementary but not identical specialties, and I think that's important. Uh, systematic reviewing requires skills that are more complex than just statistics, although I think some statisticians don't seem to realize that, and, to, and that's not to their credit. Uh, Meta-analysis as a field is influenced by its connections with statistics as a field. I think it's drawn towards more technical issues that uh, may or may not be entirely relevant to systematic reviewing. On the other hand, systematic reviewing as a, as a field of activity is firmly grounded in the non-technical and I would say scientific and policy challenges of doing systematic reviews. And these are in their own way as complex as the statistical challenges that, that uh, influence meta-analysis in its purer sense. I think one particular challenge that our field of systematic reviewing is facing and that draws it away from the more technical challenges of meta-analysis is the challenge of doing systematic reviews for an audience of policymakers and practitioners for the purposes of informing policy and practice. Reviews that are intended to serve policy purposes are inevitably different. They, they are different and they should be different than reviews that are done solely for scientific purposes. And this distinction between reviews uh, that are done for scientific purposes versus policy purposes is, I think, important. The reason is that systematic reviews that are done for scientific purposes can expect their audience to have some technical and scientific background in the relevant area. It means that those reviews can use the wealth of knowledge that a scientist has about the field of science in which they work. They can draw on the technical language, the jargon that is the vernacular for communication among scientists in a given area. That makes the task of communicating systematic reviews to the audience that they're intended for much easier. Reviews for policy purposes, on the other hand, uh, can't assume that their audience have strong, is going to have a strong scientific background. They can't assume, in fact, that their audience knows anything about science. 
And they cannot assume, importantly, that scientific language, that is jargon, can be used without translation. And I want to emphasize the word translation here. Uh, I, I believe that the language many of us scientists talk to one another in is just as impenetrable to those who aren't part of our club as a foreign language would be to a, uh, a, a non-speaker of that language. It's actually made more difficult because some of the words we use are jargon that are the same words that are used in a non-technical context to mean something different. And that, that creates the challenge of you know, false cognates in these two languages. So one of the things that I will just point out to all of you who've been doing this, uh, but I don't think I need to point it out, is that there are challenges in describing studies or treatments or outcomes in ways that are, in, that are intelligible, that are, that are uh, understood in the way you intend um, for people who are not scientists. The audience of policymakers and practitioners need a more careful and more articulate and translated version of the kinds of things we could take for granted among uh, scientists. Things like how we evaluate studies uh, to determine which ones are reliable enough to take seriously, how we describe effects and how we understand the logic of generalizing findings from the studies we've observed to those we hope their results apply to. Those are all very difficult even among, uh, uh, in some ways, even among scientists, but they assume a great deal of additional difficulty when we're trying to communicate with uh, non-scientists. And as I would argue, they present difficult translation problems. And these translation problems are not in and of themselves trivial enough that they can be resolved without serious research. They present researchable problems and research on them is desperately needed. An anecdote that, I, that I've told more than once is, uh, and it happened not so long ago, uh, I was in a meeting of uh, some senior policymakers in, uh, actually they were in, in uh, the US and the meeting was convened with uh, half a dozen people who were all technical specialists and the man who was running a, uh, a particular uh, uh, office in, in the US government said, well, the first thing we have to do is figure out how to describe effects so that teachers can understand them. And how do we describe effect sizes in a way that, that is, is completely transparent and will communicate properly? And it occurred to me and I said, we are exactly the wrong audience to make that decision. We're, you know, he was planning that we would do this in the first 15 minutes of the meeting and then we'd get on to you know, other things. And I argued that this was something impossible to do with the group he had surrounding a, the table, that in order to accomplish that, one needed research on how the intended users interpreted what we said in our, in our summaries, our systematic reviews, and that you know, the, only way to, the only way to understand how, whether a translation has been effective is to try to understand what the people you're trying to communicate with think it means and, uh, and tweaking it until their understanding corresponds to what you hope they would understand. I think we need research like this to help improve the quality of our communication of systematic reviews for policy purposes. And I'm absolutely convinced that the disciplines of cognitive psychology and what I call the new journalism, this is journalists who are doing laboratory research, have a lot to offer in uh, helping us do better research on translation and ultimately do better translation of our work for the audiences we intend. The distinction of review and purpose uh, the purpose of audience, the purpose and audience of reviews is, is made more important by what I 
see as the emergence of a new institutional form. And that new institutional form is providing a lot of the energy in systematic reviewing these days. The emergence of evidence-based policy has created a demand from policymakers uh, for evidence they can use. And that in turn has created new institutions that are intermediaries between researchers and policymakers. Uh, the Campbell Collaboration was one of these first evidence brokers in the social sciences. And I'm using, there, there isn't exactly a good word for this new institution, but I, I'm, I'll call them evidence brokers for this talk. Uh, they are sometimes called clearing houses, but the point is um, there is an institution that has emerged and occupying the role of doing systematic reviews for social science purposes. Some of these evidence brokers are like the Campbell Collaboration Independent Professional Organizations. Uh, others are funded by philanthropy. There are now more than 30 organizations in the world that identify themselves as research clearing houses. And so the word clearing house is often used to, to uh, describe these, these evidence brokers. Uh, some of these evidence brokers, these clearing houses are supported uh, entirely by government. Um, the, one of the most prominent that I know about is the US What Works Clearing House. Uh, there are certainly others and Campbell's, you know, enjoys some government support, but it's not a wholly owned government entity. Uh, the Educational Endowment Foundation in the UK supports a toolkit project, which is in essence an evidence brokerage um, project. But I think what's important for us to remember here uh, is one that the Campbell collaboration has helped create this. We have been the, um, the existence proof that such an institution is important in society. But the other thing I wanna mention to you, I wanna hearken back to that history I was talking about in the physical sciences, it's not unprecedented that evidence brokers are, ne are necessary to identify the evidence that's in the research literature and bring it together to evaluate that evidence and synthesize it and make it available to the people who need the evidence. That's exactly what the National Standard Data Reference System does. It's exactly uh, in the US, it's exactly what CODATA does internationally. And it's exactly what Campbell and other evidence brokers are beginning to do in the social sciences. So there's a compelling need that's been felt in other fields uh, that we're addressing. And I think it's important for us to see that although what we're doing is unprecedented in the social sciences, it's not unprecedented in science. Now, I think the emergence of evidence brokers, many supported or entirely controlled by governments is important um, and it supports the new professional identity of systematic reviewers. It creates demand for the specialty. It furthers its differentiation uh, and collaboration. Uh, it helps support training, but there are some dangers associated with these evidence brokers. And I wanna talk about three um, of those dangers. And they're dangers to our field and to Campbell in particular. One set of challenges are about authority. Um, are some evidence brokers more reliable than others? Uh, how does an evidence broker have the authority to be believable? And why uh, should we uh, think that? There are challenges of methodology. If different clearinghouses use different methodology, which one's right? If one clearinghouse says certain studies are reliable and another clearinghouse says other studies are reliable, Who's right and why should we believe them? Which methodology is, is the one we should be uh, regarding as the more valid? There are challenges of consistency or you know, its opposite, cacophony. If you have a series of clearinghouses, all or evidence brokers, all providing systematic reviews and making claims that they speak for the science, but they say different things, how is a user to distinguish? How is it that they can all be scientific if they contradict one another? 
I think these challenges are things we need to be wary of. And I would argue that, that we as a field should seize the future. We're the specialists. We're the ones who define this field. And we should take it upon ourselves to face the challenges that are being created by evidence programs. I think it's important that we don't concede too much authority to well-funded or well-publicized clearinghouses. And this can be hard. Uh, for example, the What Works Clearinghouse in Education has a huge budget, a big staff, federal government backing in the US. It's a behemoth that's widely emulated by other clearinghouses. Uh, I don't think that means it's unstoppable though, because the WWC staff see themselves as professional systematic reviewers and the profession, including us in the Campbell collaboration, can influence them uh, because the, clear, the WWC is run by government. It has to be sensitive uh, to comments on its regulations and procedures and methodology. There's a formal channel for influencing the way they make decisions about what to do. And I say this truth in advertising, I, I am a principal investigator on the What Works Clearinghouse, so I'm keenly aware of what our procedures are and that we must listen to the comments of people on the outside. I think it's important not to concede too much uh, to well-funded or well-publicized clearinghouses on methodology. Uh, especially government-owned clearinghouses have to have well-defined procedures uh, but their role in methodological research is really not so major. They're not well, they're not funded to do methodological research. And they're not equipped to do methodological research. Often the capacity, even, even in the What Works Clearinghouse, which I know to be reasonably large and well-funded, there's very limited capacity to do methodological research. And therefore, these clearinghouses have to rely on external methodological folks, the, an external methodological community to provide answers. I can tell you that the first thing we do when we run into a problem in the What Works Clearinghouse is we ask, uh, what's been published on this? You know, who know, you know let's, go, let's go look at the literature to see if anybody has, has a solution to this problem. And I think all information brokers face similar methodological problems. There's a real opportunity, therefore, to create partnerships among them to identify both methodological problems and find common solutions. We need to be mindful that each broker has got their own context and history and particular reasons for existence. So we can't expect all information brokers to adopt any, any one set of standards wholesale. But I think a lot can be gained from trying to harmonize methods. And there's a reason for wanting to harmonize. And that's because although variation is good, too much variation in procedures and methods threatens us all. Imagine the nightmare scenario of well-funded evidence brokers that are essentially advertising arms of trade organizations, but at arm's length, so it isn't so obvious. For those of you who can't imagine a nightmare scenario like that, uh, Google the Tobacco Institute and its role in trying to promote smoking uh, prior to the settlement in 1998. Such an organization can confuse and discredit other evidence brokers. And it certainly did in the case of tobacco. Purposeful harmonization of methods, standards, and procedures gives those harmonized methods, standards, and procedures authority. Even though evidence brokers are gonna have different methods and procedures, we would like them to, to, to all be within a generally accepted range that is collectively defined by the field and authorized, therefore, by the field. And I think this is one of our challenges as, as a new professional specialty. I'm really proud of the Campbell Collaboration for helping to create this new professional specialty in the social science of systematic reviewers. I'm also proud that the Campbell Collaboration is really been on the ground floor of creating a new kind of institution in the social sciences, the evidence broker. And I'm confident that as a leading evidence broker, Campbell will play uh, a great role in supporting systematic, the, this new specialty and this new kind of institution uh, because it's essential in social science. Thank you. <laughs>